Hey guys, my name is Joe, and today we're going to be talking about the bifunctional enzyme. This enzyme is one that a lot of people think is really confusing, but once you understand it, it's actually pretty simple. So that's what I'm going to try and help you guys with today. So, what I've got here next to me are the first couple steps of glycolysis, right? You've got glucose uh, becomes glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1-6-bisphosphate. Now, if you guys have learned gluconeogenesis already, you know that this here is one of the steps that is bypassed in gluconeogenesis. And the reason for that is because this step, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, is very highly regulated because it is an ATP investment, uh, right? Like going in this direction, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, we use ATP. And as we know, we like to regulate the steps that we use ATP in a lot. So much so that we uh, found my marker that we make a molecule whose sole purpose in life is to regulate this one step. So that molecule is called fructose 2 6 bisphosphate. So notice the product is fructose 1 6 bisphosphate, and the regulatory molecule is fructose 2 6 bisphosphate. Today we're going to be talking about a lot of different enzymes but all of the twos um, end up being part of this regulatory pathway and all of the ones end up being part of glycolysis or gluconeogenesis. So notice that the, whenever we have a two in this enzyme, just think that it may be part of the regulatory pathway. So fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a molecule that activates the forward reaction by activating PFK1. So Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate um, allows glycolysis to continue and it actually promotes it. So fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, the regulatory molecule, promotes the forward reaction and actually inhibits the backwards reaction. The reason for that is going to become clear in a minute, but for now, what I want you guys to remember is that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a molecule your body makes when it wants to make glycolysis go forward. I can leave that up there for now, actually. So, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is made by the bifunctional enzyme. That is, the, that is how this is tied together. And we call it bifunctional. But really, its functions are pretty connected. So it has it has these two subunits: the phosphofructokinase two. Notice the two means it's making the regulatory molecule, and FBPase two. Essentially, all these do are it takes fructose 6-phosphate, which is the same fructose 6-phosphate that's in the pathway, and it makes it into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. That's the regulatory molecule. So the, uh, that's one function of the enzyme. The other function is to break it back down into fructose 6-phosphate. So let's look at this, and as we could probably have guessed, since this, is, this has one phosphate and this has two phosphates, this direction actually uses ATP. And the backwards reaction, what do you think it does? If you guessed make ATP, that's incorrect. It does not make ATP, that's why I wanted to mention this. It releases an inorganic phosphate into the solution, but it does not make another ATP. Okay, so this is the bifunctional enzyme. What it does is not particularly confusing. What is a bit confusing is its regulation because yes we do have molecules that regulate this enzyme even though the, this enzyme makes a regulator molecule. So this molecule the regulatory molecule is made in this process and now we're going to talk about the regulation which is the fun stuff
All right. Give me a minute to draw this because it's a bit of drawing. But I'll talk while I draw. So I'm going to draw it the way your professor draws it in the notes because it's actually a pretty intuitive way. So this is the bifunctional enzyme, and these are its two subunits. The first one we said was PFK2, and the second one we said was FBP ACE2. All right? So the way the bifunctional enzyme works is only one half of it is active at any one time, right? So it wouldn't make sense to have both of them on at once because then you would just be making a molecule and breaking it down again and just wasting ATP. So only one half of the enzyme is on at any one time. And you don't, as far as I'm aware, and for the purposes of this class, you don't ever have a time when both of them are off either. So one of them will always be on, the other will always be off. So here I'm going to draw the two cases. We could either have PFK2 on and the other one off, or we could have FBPase2 on and the other one off. All right, so how does the molecule choose which half is on and off? It actually does it at one regulator site, right? We're just going to draw it there. But at this one regulator site, if you have an oxygen molecule, I'm sorry, not an oxygen, if you have an alcohol group, an OH, on this regulatory site, then it's going to promote uh, the, the enzyme to be in this form right here with PFK2 on and the other version off, okay? So now, if this alcohol group gets replaced with a phosphate, then the enzyme will be in the form where FBPase2 will be on and the other side will be off. That's just something you guys have to remember, that when it, become, when it gets phosphorylated, right, that's what's happening here, when it gets phosphorylated, it turns on FBPase2, okay? So, now let's talk about how that phosphorylation actually happens. All right, so now let's start with the unphosphorylated protein, uh, with the unphosphorylated enzyme up here. So PFK2 is on. What does that mean is happening right now? So if PFK2 is on, if you guys remember from the graph I had up earlier, that means that we are making the uh, regulatory molecule. We're making fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate which means that the forward pathway of glycolysis is being activated right now. So in this form up here, glycolysis is being activated because this is pumping out the regulatory molecule that's promoting glycolysis. So now let's say we want the opposite to happen. We want to turn this half off and this half on. Well, there is an enzyme that does that, and it's called cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase A. If you guys have watched my G-protein coupled receptor video, you will remember that protein kinase A is always, at least for the purposes of this class, cyclic AMP dependent. So the name is a little redundant, but just remember that it is a protein kinase A uh, that phosphorylates this enzyme, which makes sense, right? It's a kinase, and any, any enzyme that's a kinase phosphorylates. So cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase A phosphorylates this enzyme and uh, causes FBPase2 half to be on. So on the other half, we have a molecule, uh, I'm sorry, we have, we have an enzyme called phosphoprotein phosphatase. Phosphoprotein phosphatase, or 
It's often abbreviated either PP1 or PPP. You could see any of those versions. Most common is PP1. So PP1 does the opposite reaction. It dephosphorylates it, bringing it back to this state. Okay? So now this is where things start to get a little fun. This entire system is hormonally regulated. So that means that hormones play a major role in determining which of these two enzymes is on and thus which, of, which half of the bifunctional enzyme is on. So as we talked about, let's go back and talk about what's happening in each case. So right here, when phosphofructokinase 2 is on, we're going to have a very high concentration of the regulatory molecule, right? And what is that high concentration going to do? It's going to increase glycolysis. All right? And by increase, increasing glycolysis, it's obviously going to decrease gluconeogenesis. That should all make sense. Now let's go over to the other side. When FBPase 2 is on, that means you're breaking apart the regulatory molecule, which means glycolysis is no longer being promoted to go forward, right? So you're going to have here a very low concentration of the regulatory molecule. Which means you're going to have low levels of glycolysis. and high levels of gluconeogenesis. All right, so let's use those as hints to figure out what happens when exactly. The two hormones that we're going to be concerned with are insulin and glucagon. So let's start with insulin. When is insulin released? So you guys should know that insulin is released uh, when you have very high levels of blood glucose. Like let's say after you ate a big meal, after you ate a cupcake, after uh, dinner, protein shaker. Actually, probably not a protein shake. That's a bad example. But right after you've had a big meal, you would have a lot of insulin in your um, blood because the function of insulin is to uh, get glucose into your cells so that glycolysis can happen and you can make energy from it, right? So let's take a step back, actually, and say, why would a high concentration of glucose in your blood be bad? Well, what do you guys know about osmotic pressure? If you have a lot of molecules of a solute, like glucose, glucose is a solute, then you're going to have a very high osmotic pressure or you guys have probably heard the term hypertonic solution, right? So what happens when you put a cell into a hypertonic solution? Well, the water rushes out and it shrivels. Um, so when you have a lot of glucose in your blood, as in the case of extreme diabetics, your blood actually becomes a sort of hyper, um, hyperosmotic solvent. And so when that happens, a lot of your cells shrivel and die. And that's actually why um, a lot of diabetics end up having uh, dead tissue build up in their lower extremities is because they end up with a lot of glucose in their blood. And so the reason I went off on that little tangent is because I wanted to illustrate how important it is for insulin to be able to get glucose out of your blood and into the cells. So <coughs> for insulin to be able to get glucose into the cells, it needs a place to put it. And the place that it puts it is into the glycolysis pathway so that it can be broken down and you can bring in even more, uh, even more glucose for glycolysis. All right, so the gist of all of that was that insulin promotes glycolysis. If you didn't understand what I uh, was going on a tangent on about for the past two minutes, that's okay, you don't really need to worry about it. Just 
just get from it that insulin promotes glycolysis. It wants glycolysis to happen. So which of these sides do you think insulin would activate in order to promote glycolysis? Well, insulin is on this side over here. Insulin, sorry guys, that marker is dying on me. Insulin activates this side over here. And the reason for that is because by insulin activating PP1, it makes the bifunctional enzyme uh, go to the point where PFK2 is turned on, which means that you have a high concentration of the regulatory molecule, which means that glycolysis is promoted, which is what insulin wants. Uh, if that doesn't make sense, just sit here and look at it for a second, and hopefully it will make sense eventually. So, now what does glucagon do? Glucagon is released into your blood when you have very low levels of blood sugar, right? When you've uh, been going through a time of starvation, or even when you wake up in the morning and you haven't eaten in 12 hours, uh, glucagon is circulating in your blood, and what glucagon wants to do is it wants to conserve glucose. So conserving glucose entails stopping glycolysis, right? Because glycolysis takes glucose and breaks it down. So glucagon wants to stop glycolysis uh, because it wants to conserve the glucose that you do have to use for really important things like your brain so you don't die. So glucagon activates the other pathway. Glucagon activates cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase A, and by doing that, it phosphorylates the bifunctional enzyme, turning on the FBPase 2 activity, which breaks apart the regulatory molecule, right? So now the regulatory molecule is gone, uh, glucose is no longer being promoted, which means we can save glucose. Okay, so that is how those two are controlled hormonally. That is actually just about it for the bifunctional enzyme. Hopefully that made sense. Uh, it's, it sounds a little bit more confusing than it actually is. This should all be intuitive once you go through it a couple times. Uh, I recommend you guys sit down and see if you can just draw this uh, from memory. And if you can do that a couple times, you're probably set. Uh, if something wasn't clear, if something uh, doesn't make sense to you, feel free to comment below and I will answer the questions as I see them. Thank you. Have a good day.